Hello again. It's great to see everybody. I hope everybody had a wonderful morning. And we're going to start before hearing from Governor Markell today by taking a look at a, a short video that we put together. You know, one of the most fun things about being at the Charles Koch Institute is that if you kind of have the perspective on the world where I do, where you're a little bit of a libertarian, you get to meet all of these extraordinary libertarian-minded people from across the country. And I had the great honor of getting to meet one of the premier judges in the United States who also identifies as a bit of a libertarian, Judge Alex Kaczynski in California just about a month ago. And Judge Kaczynski is such a fascinating guy. He actually grew up originally in Romania behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, you know, he talked about his first trip to the other side of the Iron Curtain and seeing oranges for the first time, which he couldn't get actually in Romania, and uh, being so astonished by it. And he said that it, the entire experience really gave him an understanding of the mischief that government can do if it becomes too powerful over an individual's life. And it was really a fantastic interview. We talked a lot about that philosophy about government when it becomes too powerful uh, with regard to the criminal justice system. And Judge Kaczynski had some very moving things to say, I think, about the notion of forgiveness. And let's uh, take a quick look at a video right now of Judge Kaczynski sharing his thoughts. Uh, so we have, um, you know, for not illegitimate reasons, we have made it much easier to sort of keep track of people and to have the past revealed. And in some cases that's justifiable for protection of society. But I think we have gone too far. I think there's such a thing as privacy, there's such a thing as forgiveness, there's such a thing as giving people truly a clean break to, to remake their lives. And our system tends to pull them back, tends to pull them down, and basically says you'll never get away. You will never have a normal life again. And I think that's too bad. I don't think that's a society we want to live in. Uh, I think we, we have traditionally been a forgiving society. We've traditionally been a generous society. We have traditionally believed in the, uh, in the, in the concept that people can reform towards good. Uh, they are not inevitably evil and they're not, not uh, forever evil. Um, and that concept seems to be dwindling. And I'm sorry to see it go. As our lunch speaker today to talk a little bit about forgiveness and to talk about criminal justice reform in his home state of Delaware, we have Governor Jack Markell, who I'm very pleased to introduce right now. Governor Markell has served as governor of Delaware since 2009. As a leader on criminal justice reform, he championed the Justice Reinvestment Act to ensure that those who enter Delaware's criminal justice system are treated in the most effective way. He also launched an interesting program called I Adapt, which is a multi-agency re-entry program for ex-offenders, which includes employment support, health care, and housing. Before becoming governor, he was a very successful businessman, had a great career as a banker, as a consultant, and as a corporate executive. He is a graduate of Brown University with a bachelor's degree in economics and development studies, and he holds an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I am pleased to welcome him to this stage, Jack Markell. Thanks for that. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and I want to thank uh, Vikran for the introduction, and I want to really thank the, uh, the Koch Institute and the Koch Foundation for putting this event together. This is truly an amazing opportunity. And for me to look out at this room and to know the different walks of life and different perspectives that are represented here, uh, I think we really owe a, a debt of gratitude to the folks from uh, both the Koch Institute and Koch Foundation, and I'd ask you to join me in thanking them right now. You know, when I was first elected governor of Delaware in 2008, I was shocked by how many people told me that one of my highest priorities must be to build new prisons, because ours were running out of room. 
And I never really gave that suggestion any real thought because I believed in my gut that the answers to our criminal justice and public safety problems ran in a different direction. And the fact that this conference is taking place is incredibly encouraging to those of us who have long had a different point of view. The diverse backgrounds and perspectives represented in this room not only show the tremendous momentum already behind criminal justice reform, but your presence here also means that it is, that major progress is truly possible. Because it will take all of us, and it's going to take everybody who has a role to play in changing the system to do what's required, to bring down the unsustainable and unjust rates of incarceration in our country. And I want to thank all of you for doing what you are doing to elevate this issue and to increase the urgency for action, because I am quite certain that every governor across the country will tell you that we cannot afford to wait to change our course. Now, I know a lot of time during this summit is going to be uh, spent dissecting and examining statistics and trends and research, but there's one number that truly stands out to me more than any other because it helps show the scale of the challenges that we face and why everybody in this, who is everybody who's involved in this discussion needs to get outside of our comfort zones, to think boldly, to think creatively about solutions that will make a meaningful dent in our prison population. And that number is 700,000. Less than 25 years ago, fewer than 700,000 people populated the entire state and federal prison system in our country. By the end of last dec the last decade, 700,000 was the number of people we're, we were releasing from that system every year. The number of African American men with the criminal record approaches 80% in some major cities across the country, and about six out of 10 inmates in Delaware are persons of color, and our non-white young people are disproportionately affected. And if you spend time in some of our inner city communities, as I have done in the predominantly black neighborhoods of Wilmington, you know that a system that is based on the mantra of lock them up and throw out the key isn't working. In Delaware, which is a state of less than a million people, we spend $270 million annually on corrections. And it's not making us any safer. And if we know that we can reduce our prison population without sacrificing public safety, that has the potential to free up significant resources to invest in the things that will make our communities stronger. Education, housing, infrastructure, and as you all know, the list goes on. Now, the scale of this challenge is enormous. And for the past seven years in Delaware, we have been working to make a course correction. Sometimes the results are immediate and easy to measure, but in other cases, the impact of our efforts is a little less clear and harder to quantify. And I want to share some of the lessons that we've learned and the ways in which our experience of trying to implement reform can help guide the path to a more sensible and just approach to criminal justice. Now, I'll start with some good news. The first lesson that we've seen is that the cultural shift that is required to change the criminal justice system, the transformation in the way that the public thinks about this issue is real. It is happening. And people may think of Delaware as a relatively progressive northeast state, but for a long time, that didn't make it any easier to address overly harsh sentencing laws. We were the last state in the country to hold out on requiring, without exception, consecutive rather than concurrent sentencing. And last year, just last year, when I proposed changing that to give our judges more discretion and to shorten sentences when appropriate, it sailed through our state house and Senate by a combined vote of 53 to 6. The Justice Reinvestment Initiative, Debbie Crant mentioned that we undertook a few years ago, brought together lawmakers, attorneys, judges, advocates, and many others to make change that simply would not have been considered just a handful of years ago. 
And as a result, I signed a law in 2012 to emphasize assessment-based decisions for bail and sentencing, to reward those who complete evidence-based rehabilitation programs with good time credits for early release, and to reform our probation and parole systems to incorporate risk and need assessments, graduated sanctions, and compliance credits to end supervision for those who are succeeding in our community. And the members of our legislature and the constituents to whom they answer are willing to accept a more thoughtful approach to administering justice, an approach that leads us in a different direction than, than what we saw in the past, which was a mentality that led to more mandatory minimums, to less judicial discretion, and a few alternatives to prison sentences for, the, for offenders who may be better served by programs that don't require jail cells. And we have got to take advantage, full advantage, of this new mindset. And a lot of the criminal justice reform that we're seeing, including many of the initiatives that I will mention, focus primarily on the people who have committed the fewest and least objectionable crimes. And this work is vital. We, make, we all know that we make families and communities stronger by successfully reintegrating those individuals into society, as well as by keeping more of them out of the system altogether through, policy, through policies like de decriminalizing the possession of small amounts of marijuana, as we did in Delaware earlier this year. But we also need to seize this moment to address the more difficult questions about repeat offenders and more serious offenders. Because if the average detentioner spends two weeks in, in the system, we need to keep 26 of them out of prison completely to eliminate one bed. For long-term offenders, you may only need to pull one or two out of the system to achieve the same reduction in the prison population. Now, research shows that crime tends to be a young person's activity. So keeping, keeping somebody in prison for many years may not be worth the cost. We need discretion in the system to allow for sentences to be shortened on a case-by-case -case basis so that we keep dangerous offenders locked up while allowing those who no longer pose a threat to return to the community. And to restore some discretion to, to sentencing, I'm looking forward to working with our state's attorney general on changing the mandatory sentencing laws for habitual offenders to better consider what those offenses are and the likelihood that they will reoffend. We don't need people serving life sentences when they haven't committed acts of violence. And we don't need to sentence drug dealers who will, who will age out of criminal behavior to life in prison. And if the first lesson that we've learned is that the public cultural shift on these issues is real and it presents historic opportunities, the second is that that's not the whole story. Because just modifying laws and policies won't make the dramatic difference that we want to see. It's harder to change the day-to-day -day practices of the people who are on the front lines of our criminal justice system every day. And I'll give you an example in one of the parts of our system that most needs reform, and that's bail. As a result of the Justice Reinvestment Act that I mentioned, Delaware's courts now use a risk assessment tool to identify, to identify defendants who are good candidates for pretrial supervision could be community-based supervision, or it could be by the Department of Correction. And I'm grateful to our judicial community for its strong support and, and partnership in crafting the law. And we know that, reigning, that, that remaining in the community enhances a, defend, a defendant's chances of success in the long term. So over the last 12 months, our population in custody has dropped about 3%, mostly among pretrial detainees. We also know that that's not enough. Requiring a pretrial risk assessment means that our judges must have access to the tool, 
but it doesn't really require them to use it effectively or to guarantee different outcomes for individual offenders. And I believe that our judges and our prosecutors recognize the big picture criminal justice challenges we face and the need for change, but it will take some time to shift the longstanding practices of defaulting to setting secured or cash bail in too many cases. And I don't say that to point fingers, but rather to point out that policymakers have to recognize the need for additional support for our justice system to make the reforms that we want. And that means fighting for our judges to have as much discretion as possible to show that we support them using their judgment rather than forcing them to adhere to more of a one-size-fits-all approach. It's why we've started to perform a weekly review of our detention population to find people with characteristics that, def that identify them as being of lower risk. And we work with the public defender, the public defender, to bring those individuals back to court for bail modification. We're making some progress and we've got to continue in that manner because an ineffective bail system means that barriers are created even before somebody is convicted of a crime or sentenced to any jail time at all. And that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, it's not working when a single mom gets stuck in detention because she can't come up with 100 bucks and has little to no family support, but a dangerous drug dealer can get his minions to bail him out. And 40% of the women incarcerated at our women's facility are pretrial detainees, many of them charged with nonviolent offenses. Our bail process has got to change, and it can be done, but only if we're cognizant to the full extent to which everybody in our criminal justice system has got to adjust their thinking. Now, one of the most effective messages when I'm out talking about the need for these reforms is the simple fact that something like 97% of the people in prison are coming out. And with the recidivism rate in our, for prisoners of around 70% in Delaware and similar numbers in a lot of states across the country, it's clear that the old tough-on-crime mentality that produced policies like truth in sentencing and mandatory minimums did not fulfill the rehabilitative mission that's embedded in, this, in the name of this system that we call corrections. Releasing ex-offenders without making it less likely to commit another crime is certainly not making any of us any safer. So in broad terms, we know the best ways to improve community reintegration. And of course, one important predictor, we think maybe the most, one of the most important predictors of somebody's odds of reoffending, is whether or not he or she has a job. But the next lesson that we learned in our state is that it takes more than you would think to give ex-offenders a decent chance to find work. It does mean supporting their education while they're in prison, and I. For me, the most inspiring event that I go to each year is the high school graduation ceremony in our prison. And to see these, these inmates who came in with so little have to work so hard and succeed in achieving that high school degree. I'm thrilled to hear that the Obama administration proposes the step of making Pell Grants available to people in state and federal prisons. It means access to job training, and we've invested significantly in expanding automotive training and culinary arts training in our prisons. But we have got to do a better job in recognizing the barriers that these individuals face. And some of them are just unbelievable. You know, we, I'll give you a specific example. And that's about getting to work in the first place. Now, some of you may live in cities where there's a great public transportation system and everybody can take public transportation everywhere they want to go. It's actually not, we have some public transportation in Delaware, but we're not New York City. We don't have subways all over. Well, across the country, we have mandates that cause even nonviolent offenders to lose their driver's license, even when their crime isn't related to driving. How does that make any sense at all? Because if you can't make it to your job interview, 
much less travel to and from work in a reasonable amount of time, it's not very likely you're going to get hired, or if you get hired, it's not very likely you're going to be able to hold down your job for an extended period of time. So we eliminated those mandates in, in Delaware, which means nearly 800 nonviolent offenders per year are having their driver's licenses returned after being released. But before we made that change, 800 people a year getting out of prison, their crime had nothing to do with driving a car, and they couldn't get a license. Are we trying to set people up for success or failure? We've also eliminated the automatic suspension of driver's licenses for Delawareans who fail to pay fines for minor traffic hazards and don't pay, pose a, tra a traffic safety hazard uh, themselves. Everybody should work to pay back what they owe. But it's also in everybody's interest to keep people safely on the road with a valid license and registration and insurance as they work to put their lives back on track. Ex-offenders need more than a driver's license. And as Vikrant mentioned, in 2009, we created this program called iADAPT. It's Individual Assessment, Discharge, and Planning Team, which is a multi-agency reentry program. You know, historically, the job of preparing people for reentry was totally within the purview of our Department of Correction. Well, when the, the fact is, the reason people so often are not successful when they get out, perhaps they don't have a job skill, perhaps they're not getting the treatment, the kind of substance abuse treatment that perhaps they were getting in prison, they may not have a place to live, they may not be able to uh, get health, the medical care they need. And so what we did is we put together this multi-agency team to make sure that we were addressing all of these issues. You know, historically, inmates would be given a risk assessment. Well, that makes sense because you want to understand what level of risk an individual poses to others within the institution. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So we started, in, in addition to giving the risk assessment, we started to give a needs assessment so we could understand at a real granular, granular level what are the issues that are likely to prevent somebody from being successful uh, when they come out. And so the help that offenders receive is very practical, uh, but beyond what we have typically thought of as the job of the correction system. So I, as I mentioned, they're enrolled in Medicaid if eligible, they're provided with identification documents and transportation vouchers, and they're connected to people that they can rely on for support as they seek housing and employment. The final lesson that I'll mention is about the future of criminal justice reform. We can be under no illusion about how difficult this is, and I know that none of you, I know that all of you understand that. Because the individuals who will be directly impacted by, this, by these policy changes have usually made pretty poor decisions, and their situations are usually not at the forefront of the public's consciousness. And even as mindsets change, it's not going to be easy to make their circumstances a very high priority in public policy. And it's not going to be easy to produce immediate successes. To build enduring public support means that we have to show that these efforts are working. We have to measure our progress. And the results are not always going to be what, they, what we hoped they would be. And the most important thing for us is to be persistent, to have faith in our mission and to keep trying new solutions to better understand what works. But there's something else here as well. And that is our obligation to remember that this is not just about new policies or system changes or major reform efforts. It's about the value to individuals, to families, to communities, and to our society as a whole when we believe in and when we fight for second chances. As Brian Stevenson, who was founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, and a native Delawarean has said so eloquently, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And because of that, there's this basic human dignity that must be respected by law. Well, the organizers of this summit and the organizations represented here recognize the need for smarter use of taxpayer dollars and building a stronger economy across our country but we are also here because we believe deeply in the dignity of every human being. And we deeply believe in our country's fundamental value of justice for all.
I'm grateful for all that you do, and I look forward to continuing to be a part of your fight. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Governor. I think we're going to do some Q&A right now. And I want everybody to know that we've got microphones set up, just like this morning. There's one over there towards the middle of the room and one right over there. And uh, I think I'll just go ahead and take the prerogative of asking the first question. You know, one thing that's really interesting about your career is that before you got into public service, as I mentioned, you were very successful in the business community. You know the business world. I said you were a consultant, you're an executive, you're a banker. I don't know how many people know this. I think you were the 13th employee at Nextel, right. right? Okay. So what do we do to incentivize the business community and the business world to hire ex-offenders? So by far the most uh, powerful thing to provide an incentive is for businesses to hear from other businesses about why they do it. And I think there is just such power in the example. You know, frankly, I think it is less about you know, government saying, you know, here is why you should do this. And it's more about when businesses hear from employers like Coke uh, Industries, as an example, this is who we are, these are our businesses. And we just fundamentally believe that if we are going to be successful as a, as a company, we need to tap into talent wherever that talent is. And sometimes that means giving somebody a second chance. And so I think it's, um, you know, I, you, you can get down a, a slippery slope. I think there, you know, to say we should use this dollar incentive or that dollar incentive. I think there's power in example. So one of the things that we've done in Delaware, we did, we, we've banned the box uh, for state employment. Um, but I think we are incredibly, thank you. We're incredibly dependent upon other you know, private sector employers taking the lead. The other role that I think we can play is we can connect employers with these individuals. So last year, as an example, we hosted a dinner at our women's prison, and we've invested a lot in culinary training in both the women's prison and the men's prison. And we hosted a dinner where uh, our women at the women's facility made dinner under the supervision of some chefs from the outside. And we invited probably 60 folks from the business community. Because when, and, and they sat at their tables with the, with, the, with the women. And when people can understand, not just in theory, but when they can relate and they can sit with somebody and they can understand that, you know, here's a real person who wants to make their life better, who all they're looking for is a shot, we think it's more likely that that's exa exactly what's going to happen, that these employers will give the, the folks within our facilities a shot. I mean, this is really hard work. Um, but I think, is, you know, so, so the government can play a role of convening. We can absolutely play the role of teaching the skills. You know, so I said, I mentioned culinary. I mentioned the uh, uh, auto mechanics. And I think what we have to do is we have to be very thoughtful about putting ourselves in the shoes of all these folks who are coming out of prison and understanding why they're un what would be the biggest barrier for them to be successful, and what is it that we can do to remove as many of those barriers as possible. It looks like we've got a question right there, or over here, excuse me. Um, Mark Fontaine from Florida. Um, you're pretty remarkable um, to hear a governor talk about getting that involved in this issue. Um, so when you go to the governor's conference and you have conversations, um, I guess the question is, how do you get other leaders like yourself engaged? Because everything you say is so logical, you wonder why we're not doing a lot more. So the good news is that you know, politics in this country has become so polarized and so partisan. That's not the good news, I, I should have said that. <laughs> I, let me, I should have started with that. Politics has become so polarized and so partisan. The good news is that this is an issue that cuts across party line. Because I think everybody gets it. And I happen to be a Democrat, 
But this is an issue that I really do believe, because you've seen some movement, that a lot of Republican governors get as well. So this is not, there's nothing partisan about this. But I think I would urge you to rethink the question, because the question is, you know, what is it that I can do to get more governors to think this way? The real question is to all of you. What can you all do to get more governors to think this way? And the beauty of this, all you have to do, I was looking, I was marveling uh, when, you know, during the lunch when the list of organizations represented in this room was scrolling down the screen. There are not very many issues where you have people from so many different walks of life, so many perspectives, frankly, a lot of folks who would not even talk to each other about a lot of other issues have figured out that this one matters. And I think, so, and, and for that, I mean, you've got to give, you know, a lot of credit, a lot of credit, for sure, to, to Coke Industries. And I mean, five years ago, who would have thought, maybe the folks who knew a lot about it, I don't know if a lot of people would have thought that Coke Industries would be the one to bring everybody together. But when you see the AC, so, but when you see the ACLU um, and, you know, so many other organizations working hand in, hand in glove, I think it, it says, it says a lot. And the good news, I think, is that not only is there a lot of agreement across party lines, but I think there's a pretty much a shared sense of why this is important, which is there is no way that we could be successful as a country. There's no way any of our communities can be successful. If we allow so many able-bodied, able-minded people to stay in the margins of society. I mean, it's just... It, it, it's, we, you know, we live in this world which, you know, it's unbelievable, the global economy is, is real and it's competitive and the idea that we live in a country that, you know, whose incarceration rate is so high relative to most other advanced countries, we need people contributing and the idea that we just sort of, you know, push them off over here for long periods of time and allow them to stay where they're not contributing just doesn't make any sense. And I think these things, it's like a pendulum that goes back and forth. And I think the good news about this is we are at a moment in time where a whole lot of people get it. We've got a question right here. Hi, Governor. Um, I'm Jim Beerman from the Police Foundation in Washington, D.C. I'm very right. in, hi, I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, very interested in your thoughts about the role of the police and uh, prisoner reentry initiatives, and what can they do to facilitate the successful reintegration of people in the community? So it's a great question, um, and I think it's uh, the answer it can be very powerful when there's trust between the police and the folks in the community. And uh, that's a two-way street. And, you know, we've seen, you know, this issue play out a bit in, in our state, and I think when you talk to the folks uh, in, who live in these communities, when they feel like they know their police officers, um, when they feel like community policing is more than just a name, and the, community, and the officers know the people on the street, they know the issues that those families are dealing with, you know, you, you create a little bit of, uh, you create a lot more trust, and I think there's a much more positive, positive role to be played. Um, and I think you see a lot of jurisdictions around the country moving in this direction. We'd like to see uh, even more. Um, but I, I'll tell you, I mean, and I, I've walked many, many times in some of the communities in, in, in our state. And, you know, most, most of the times, uh, these communities have, have wanted to see police on the street. The problem is, if they're not seeing them all the time, if they're not seeing the same people, and they don't have that same kind of personal relationship, uh, then it's not as powerful. I think we have another question there. My name is Ethan Fampy. I work on asset forfeiture and marijuana issues, but I wanted to ask a question about your thoughts on the scope of uh, executive power as a, as a, 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 as a place for uh, some of these reforms can really be bolstered. And I'm thinking of particularly uh, President Roosevelt's uh, clemency actions for alcohol offenders under prohibition. Uh, do you think that things like, uh, you know, clemency to 
drug offenders or nonviolent offenders is something that, um, do you see a role for you know, your executive uh, um, power in, in that, in that in a, in being used in a similar way? Well, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. So I, like many governors, I do have the um, uh, executive power to grant a pardon. I have a lot of applications every single month. And I, sat, I, I served as state treasurer for 10 years. And I served uh, as state treasurer. I served on the Board of Pardons. And it was remarkable to me every single month how many people came before us at the age of 32, as an example, who had you know, done something stupid. I mean, but some, you know, frankly, some of the same stupid things that I may have done when I was that age, they happened to have gotten caught for it. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, mar marijuana. And it literally, they have paid a price from the age of 18 to the age of 32. And they, you know, they can't, they can't get the job that they want. It comes up every time they apply for a new job. And so those are cases where routinely uh, we do uh, grant those, um, uh, that kind of uh, clemency, but it's, re it's really done on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, unfortunately, I've got the signal here that says that's the final question, so I think we're going to have to call it quits. And I think we're now just going to take a short break before convening for our business panel, which will again be right here on this main stage. Before that, though, please uh, join me in a round of applause for Governor Jack Martin. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.